Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Mark Bell's Power Project Podcast. Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Free Sleeve. Free Sleeve is awesome, man. Not only is it used by professional NBA teams, NFL teams, strongmen like Hapthor Bjornsson, but the cool thing about the Free Sleeve is that you're able to ice hard to ice areas efficiently. Okay, so the Free Sleeve is like a knee sleeve or elbow sleeve. You put it around the area post workout and you get all around not just compression, but icing without a mess. And then the other cool thing is they have a flat pack, which is almost kind of like a little blanket type sleeve, but you can put that on your back. You can drape it over your shoulder, your traps, and you can just have great icing post-workout to help with recovery. Yep. They call it 360 degree cold therapy treatment. Uh, really, it's it's amazing that it's so malleable right out of the freezer. It's mm. kind of my favorite thing because, you know, yeah, it is hard to ice the entire elbow, but you throw that thing on and it covers your entire uh, body part. So please head over to freesleeve.com at checkout, enter promo code POWER25 for 25% off your order and free domestic shipping on all domestic orders. All right, let's, let's get this party started. Eh? Were you already recording, Andrew? I am now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Dr. Mike. They should be connecting soon. Oh, there he is. What up? Is he shirtless? I don't see anything. Else. I don't see anything either. I see him. You do. Wow. Mm -hmm. I see yeah. you guys. I see something. I see there he is. Ah. Well, he's a doctor, so things are going to be different. Makes hey, sense. Mark, I like that you take my uh, podcast appearance seriously enough to be in your fucking car. You know, that's cool. <laughs> hey, I made hey. time for this or whatever. I could have been in my car, I guess. Hey, listen, you fat motherfucker. Touche to you for not shaving your fucking head. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, that? if you're going to be in your car, then I don't have to shave at all. That's right. I don't know why I put on clothes. You didn't even shave your balls for this podcast. You have no idea if that's true. Disgraceful. <laughs> And there's gray hairs coming in. That's fucked up. Why are you going to point that out? <laughs> Just because you're point out the obvious. Rippled old man doesn't mean I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not crippled. I could still <laughs> squat 135 halfway down. Yeah. Show me a cripple that can squat 135. You're overqualified. <laughs> See? <laughs> hey, awesome having you on the show today. I'm, I'm super excited. I've been watching. You know, preaching that full range of motion, and you got that. You got a whole a whole team of doing uh, full range of motion. So I just I think it's fascinating because I know a lot of people want to do more weight, and people get excited. And the main reason why people do more weight is just because they're <laughs> they're ego lifting and they want to throw on that extra plate. And so I wanted to dive into that a bunch today because I think a lot of people are throwing on that extra plate and. It's not always necessary. So what are some of your thoughts on it? Well, there's a couple ways you can uh, go about this. One is just go directly to the scientific research, which is like limited because, you know, it's mostly on pencil neck undergrads. But most of that research shows that full range of motion is better than partial range of motion for eliciting hypertrophy gains and also strength gains most of the time. So on that note, it's pretty one-sided. There's one bullshit tricep study people bring up in the comments that they don't have the, uh, <laughs> the, the training to understand what that actually implies. But, you know, so there's some maybes there. But generally speaking, more full range of motion is usually best from what the science says. On top of that, the physiological and anatomical rationale of like knowing that what we know about the human body and how muscles grow, motor unit activation. So, for example, if you like move your arm like this, versus you move it like this, versus you move it all the way. Some parts of your muscle never really turn on maximally if you're doing partials. And if you're doing full, then most of the muscle turns on and thus it grows more. And a couple other lines of reasoning would show us that even if we didn't have direct research, we would expect full range of motion to cause the best gains. Another pathway through that is tension generated during a stretch is really, really powerful. It has been shown in the lab to grow a lot of muscle. And, you know, if you don't squat all the way down and actually feel the tension on your quads while they're stretching, I think it's difficult to make a, an assertion that you're getting that pathway checked off the list. So if you go down through it, both on the research end and the rationale end, full range of motion seems to be just generally, there's definitely uh, situations in which it's not a good idea. But generally speaking, as like a first principle, it's a good idea to do large range of motion. Uh, and then you have to have good reasons for not doing it. My problem, and I go on a nice long rant about this, or a short but very aggressive rant, um, most people who try to excuse partial range of motion 
are just trying to, am I allowed to swear in here? I forgot what the policy is. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yep. <clears throat> They're trying to fit their mouth Anaconda style around as big of a pro bodybuilder cock as they can. <laughs> like, uh, uh, like how can I suck maybe multiple pro bodybuilder dicks at the same time so I can be cool? And they're like, this fucking pro doesn't do full rum, pussy, what do you think about that? And I'm like, if you could have his balls and dick in your mouth at the same time, you probably would, motherfucker. <laughs> like, stop not hugging. You're not thinking. You're just doing some shit this jack motherfucker does. And the thing is, if you talk to that motherfucker, you'd realize he's the stupidest person you've ever talked to. He's no idea why he's big. Well, we all know, pretty good genetics, 20 years of training, and a shitload of gear, tons of food, and then he's jacked. And he's like, I'd like to fucking do this because it feels better. Shut up. I don't care what you think. You're not thinking. That's not, I'm not a thinking person. I don't go to you for thinking. I go to you for being like, wow, that guy's jacked. Next. You know, that's really, that's really it. So nut hugging is taking the place of logic for most people, which is why they just desperately try to justify partial ROM. And I'll take it to another level. The reason they try to justify it is a two factor. One, they want to use more weights. So they don't have to feel bitch made because they're actually fucking weak. So they want to be like, yeah, I can fucking handle the seventies. Like what the fuck does handle mean? You mean lift through a four inch motion? Like, well, I can't do that. Like, you know, shit, you can unrack the shit. It's fine. But number two is like in a lot of lifts, full range is fucking hard. And, and I don't want any part of that. To quote my friend Mike Zendelovich, who you may know out in California is a very good powerlifter. He's like, you know, what is it down there at the bottom of the squat that I really want? What is it down there that interests me? Nothing. Why would I go down that far? And the thing is, is that like shit fucking hurts, man. Nobody wants to do full depth hacks and squats and presses and this shit like stretches you. It feels uncomfortable. You might die down there. So a lot of guys, first of all, want to lift big weights and feel manly. And second of all, they, they don't want the pain of doing full ROM. And also they want to be like their fucking not hugging favorite pro bodybuilder who's a fucking moron. And then voila, three fucking factors, some bullshit science guy, professor, asshole with parents gray in his beard as you pointed out is like you should do a full rama who the fuck am i and then that's why we have most people doing partials Ta -da. i love it <laughs> you know okay i want to i want to ask on top of that mike because a lot of guys aren't willing to use low enough weight uh to go full rama with it they want to increase they want to increase their weight faster, but they also are probably trying to increase their weight faster because they consistently hear progressive overload, working with more volume over time is going to allow me to work more. So instead of squatting 225, full range of motion, I should instead try squatting 315, part of the way down, reaching kind of depth, but not all the way. What would be the encouragement for an individual to lower that weight to 225, 235, get that full range of motion, even though it's uncomfortable, if they're able to squat slightly heavier, heavier weight with slightly less range of motion. Totally. So we know that volume is what really determines hypertrophy as long as weight's heavy enough to like provide some resistance. And then we can ask like, okay, are the guys lifting the most weight the biggest or are the guys lifting the most volume the biggest? Look at how bodybuilders train versus powerlifters. Powerlifters lift more weight than bodybuilders through a slightly smaller range of motion. And you know, are they as big? No, bodybuilders are bigger. Why? Because they do more reps and they just do more sets. So if, you know, volume is calculated as the total amount of physical work you're doing, work is force times distance. If you lower your distance, you're doing less fucking work. Wow. Like that's it. So you can lift a lot of weight and that'll make you strong in that range of motion, but it's not the best way to get big. You get big doing full ranges of motion with a weight that you can honestly fucking do. And the other thing I would say, to the guys that are doing that is like, do you think you're fucking tricking anybody? Do you think you're tricking your body? Like, yeah, just going to throw on some plates, but they'll cut it halfway. Like, dude, you're the man. Oh my God. You just got 50 pounds stronger. Right. Or did you actually just cut the fucking lift and you're lying to yourself? They know the fucking lie to themselves. So I just like to call people straight out. Like if you count someone's reps in the squat and they go halfway down, like, hey, count my reps, man. I fucking lose track when I fucking lose my mind. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm like, zero, 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 zero. They're like, what are you doing? I'm like, you haven't squatted yet, motherfucker. You've been going halfway down this entire time. Do I'm going to count partials? Half. 
one, 1. 1.5. There you go. There's your extra credit. So like a lot of times, you know, you could give a technical reason like science and shit, like, well, partials and force curves. But like at the end of the day, the reason they're doing partials is not a technical reason. It's just ego bullshit and trying to get away from the pain of two things, physical pain of going low and the psychological pain of realizing you're not a 315 squatting type motherfucker. You're not. You're a 225 type of squatting motherfucker. That's just who you are. So when people say like, what kind of, what kind of weights are you doing in the squat? You have to go 425 and it doesn't feel nice. You want to be like, yeah, I fucking handle 405, but look at your fucking legs. You pussy motherfucker. They're not, they're not that big. And it makes sense. Nobody looks at you and goes, Oh, there's a guy who can squat four or five for ups. They look at your legs and they know you're 225 squatting motherfuckers. There's nothing wrong with that. Cause over time, five pounds here, 10 pounds there, you're going to have 365 pounds squatting legs. And then people will believe you. The worst thing in the world is when someone like come to train with you or some shit and you look at their legs and you're like, Oh, you respect, you know what I'm saying? I remember my first rodeo and I remember when I didn't train legs and then you start loading up the weight and you're like, so I'm working up to four or five on the high bar squat. Did you want to, and they're like, I'm going, I'm good. I'm good up to four or five. I'm like, no, you're not. Who the fuck are you lying to? Like you can't, your legs can't lie. So if you actually want to get jacked, don't lie to yourself. Use the weight that makes your legs bigger, not the shit that makes your ego feel temporarily nice uh, and it's not even that nice because everyone who knows their shit knows you're a fucking bullshit artist. I mean, can you imagine some guy goes to the gym you two are in and he's like loading up six plates and doing quarter squats and yelling. Yeah, grandma in the corner and that 15-year-old in the corner like, oh my God, this is the strongest person I've ever seen. You two are just like rolling your eyes out of your head. You know, who does that guy like, who's respected as he wants? Like, oh my God, that's Seema and Mark Bell. Like, they see me lifting. Like, yeah, they think you fucking suck. And like, you go impress the 15-year-old. And it, it turns out it doesn't even impress anybody. So like, it's a culture there. People just have to nut up and just do the shit that like is humbling as fuck, but it works. And if you want to lie to yourself, fucking lie to yourself, man, go for it. Just don't, you know, don't lie to the rest of us. It's fucking insulting. Uh, when, like when somebody is, uh, is just starting out and they're trying to get, you know, used to the weights and, and stuff like that, let's say they just have like, I don't know, they have crappy range of motion cause they have poor mobility and stuff. What are some recommendations you give there? I saw in a few of your videos, uh, you recommend like Olympic lifting shoes and then you recommend maybe, uh, altering like the leg press so that you can, and then stuff like that. Yeah. There's a ton of stuff that you can do. Number one is choosing a stance for your body that accommodates your like differential joint structures and anatomical positioning. So like super close stance squats are not for everyone because you have to have like relatively long torso and short femurs to be able to hit good depth like that. If you're working with someone who has longer legs, especially longer femurs and a shorter torso, you got to usually put their feet out wider. And yeah, you can look at someone's body and think, okay, okay, they got to go wider, but it's really just a matter of experimentation. So what you do as a beginner lifter is first of all, get somebody around you that knows the fuck they're doing, you know, like it just barely knows more than you is a good start. And then just play with your technique. Cause a lot of people just want to get their technique going and just start piling on the weight. Take a few weeks, use some weight that's challenging, but like try closer stance, try a little wider stance, see if you can stay upright and go a little deeper after a few sets really. And definitely a few sessions, you're going to be like, all right, like this stance right here, I feel like I can get pretty deep. Maybe you're just above parallel. Then you keep playing with the technique a little bit, but you can change your chest angle. You can change your hip angle a little bit. You can play with which way you point your toes. That'll get you another couple of inches. Uh, uh, get you a couple of inches, <laughs> dick joke. So, so in any case, once you get that, like you're well on your way to maybe like breaking parallel. And then what you can do is try to do some pause squatting, which is a really awesome way to do two things. One, it gets you time at the bottom to actually actively stretch under load. So in a pause squat where you like start above parallel a little bit, you pause for two or three seconds, you'll notice as you're pausing, you actually start descending a little bit. It stretches the tissues out. And after your rep five, you're actually going significantly deeper and that's muscle memory. Your body's learning how to do that. First of all, second of all, when you do those pause squats, you'll notice that whatever kind of technique you have, when you pause, there'll be like more and less comfortable ways of pausing that deep. So for example, if your feet are pointed this way, you do a couple of pause squats, you notice like at the bottom, your knees are kind of, you guys ever like point your feet too straight and your knees are kind of like, nah, fam, this shit ain't working. And then you do this with your feet on the third rep and you're like, oh shit, that feels so much better. And you get another couple of inches deeper. 
after multiple sets like that of just feeling it out, dude, all of a sudden you're squatting significantly below parallel over time, putting more weight on the bar, continuing that feeling out process using pauses, you get deeper and deeper and deeper. In addition to that, you can do deep leg presses and deep lunges to physically stretch out the tissues and become more mobile. You can do deep high bar good mornings and stiff legged deadlifts to get the posterior chain a lot of flexibility. And after a while, just doing like another half inch more depth, another half inch more depth. After six months, eight months, 12 months, you're at a place where you're like fucking squatting super deep. And people are like, oh my God, you're so gifted, your ankle mobility. You're like, shit doesn't have dick to do with it. A lot of it is just technique. First, good basic technique. And second of all, just settling in and finding your technique through shit like pauses and going a little lower, a little lower. Because a lot of people are like, look at my squat, it sucks. It's like, I can't even get depth. And it's like, you're doing pretty well. Like, that's fine. You don't need to be like a full ROM hero right away. Like you're getting almost to parallel. Keep at it. Do some pauses. Sit down there. Try to wiggle a little bit. Get a little deeper. And if you add a half inch every month, after a while, you're well in the game. And, and, and that's, it just takes time. I think a lot of people do this Instagram bullshit. You guys know those memes that these fitness pages put up, like how to fix your squat depth in 18 steps. And you're like, fuck do people read the shit on their phones. This text is like this big, there's references and shit. And they're like, oh, this is like a one step guide to me fixing my fucking life and squat depth. These 18 tips, people just want to fix it. A lot of the shit takes practice. I mean, can you imagine if you walked in to like a gymnastics training center, like an elite center and you're like, hey, I want to like be able to do an iron cross. They're going to be like, word up. Okay, we'll sign up. We'll see you here. It's going to be like, you know, a year <laughs> before you do it. And you're like, no, 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 no. I need a hack. I need to do it now. Thanks for some people squatting deep. Shit takes time. You know, like how long did it take you guys to work your bench and deadlift out to the mature lift that it is now? The shit's not instant. So I think a lot of people are like, I have a mobility problem. How do I fix it? It's like you work on your mobility slowly but surely, figuring out your body, playing with stances, using heavy weight, doing pauses, and being patient. And the shit takes some time. Mike, what about just uh, going for it here and there? You know, like just, you know, you're doing some sets and you are keeping full range and you're just, I don't know, you're getting fired up, you're getting excited and you want to maybe shorten the range of motion to, uh, you know, sometimes like in when bodybuilding techniques, sometimes you kind of like pump the reps and you don't do full range of motion. It's actually like something I, when I'm telling somebody kind of how to do a bodybuilding set, I'll oftentimes tell them like, Hey, it's, kind of a partial range of motion almost looks like a photo press uh when it comes to like something like a bench press or a dumbbell bench you'll see a lot of bodybuilders kind of keeping that tension on um do you agree with kind of doing stuff like that here and there um what, what are your thoughts on that no i think it's just fucking people get bored people's egos get in the way people get lazy um you know like here i can give you a pretty decent example you know, say you're eating bodybuilding meals, try to get in real good shape, rice, chicken, and bullshit, boring bodybuilding food. And then, like, you have this bright idea, you're like, dude, let's go out and fucking get, like, burritos or fucking chicken tenders. And someone's like, yeah, that's fucking sweet. Like, that'll feel good. A little fucking something different for the body. You know, it increases your sodium a little bit. You get a bit more of a pump the next day, and you're like, yeah, man, it's fuck chicken tender diet. And it starts to be this meme. And then guys are like, man, every time I have chicken tenders, I had great workouts. And like, really, where did that come from? You just didn't want to fucking grind chicken and steak anymore. But who the fuck gets more jacked than everyone? People who grind chicken and steak. And like, I remember Ronnie Coleman, after the 2002 Olympian GNC Show of Strength, which he did not win, the GNC Show of Strength, first time in a long time, he got pissed. He said he basically ran a relatively strict diet for that entire rest of the year. He was just like, I was just on my shit the entire time. There wasn't a time where I was like free off in the wind doing whatever bullshit. And you're like, God damn, that's humbling as fuck, right? The reality is that's how the shit needs to be done if you want it to be done optimally. And you can tell yourself like, let's do some partials and have some fucking fun. Because look, fuck it. it. The shit is fun, man. And it's time to let loose and do some. Like, so for example, I'm a big ass fucking fan of periodization. This shit is in my fucking company name, of course. But like, you know, planning, programming, progression. Like I love a plan. Every now and again, when I'm traveling with my friends and we get to a gym, we just do like, let's fucking hit chest and biceps. We just pick some fun machines and yeah, we do full range of motion and shit, but like we just do weird shit and like drop sets and stupid bullshit. Can I justify that? Other than the fact that it's generally effective and fun as shit? No, but like, I know it's fun as shit. So 
I think a lot of the guys that do the pump reps and shit gives you a cool pump and it feels different. It's something different. That's why people do it. Not because it's some magically effective thing. Mm. You're like, well, the fucking thing is it's constant tension. The constant don't get me fucking started or do get me started on constant tension. Bullshit. <laughs> Total bullshit. And people justify the shit because they're fucking bored and it sucks to have to do Tom Platt's like workouts all the fucking time. What's the like, research what's the research say about like constant tension or partial range of motion reps? Very little direct research on it. There's that one tricep study, but I'd like to see that study replicated before we go off and the make fucking a crazy tricep push down study. One fucking yeah, skull crusher study. Um, skull crusher. but like uh, as far as constant tension, just on logic alone, people are like, well, fucking constant tension. You're like, mm, so what's good about constant tension? You're like, you're not letting the muscle rest. I'm like, uh, so you do, when you do five sets of 10, is it better to just do 50 reps instead? They're like, no, you'd get tired. So what's the point of doing five by 10? Well, your muscles rest so you can try harder. I'm like, uh, but what if you rest a little between each rep by locking it out? Doesn't that mean you get more reps per set? Like, uh huh. Doesn't that mean your faster twitch muscle fibers actually do a larger proportion of work? Uh huh. Doesn't that mean they grow more? Uh huh. So back to constant Why is that good? Like, I don't know. Like, yeah, you don't know. That was the answer all along. So constant tension, people say, like, oh, constant tension. And it's what uh, economist and philosopher Thomas Sowell would call a notion. It's not a hypothesis, it's not a theory. It's a, a notion, just an idea people have in their heads. They never even checked with logic. They're like, fuck, God's tension, bro. Like, why? And they can't even explain it. I've never seen anyone explain it. They're like, well, it fatigues the muscle. Like, sweet. So why don't you fatigue the muscle by doing constant tension for five or six reps, lock out rest for a little bit, and then keep going? They're like, okay. Like, but that's not constant tension. Like, yeah, but you can't more out of the muscle. Like, yeah. So what the fuck were you saying about constant tension? Like, what's wrong with resting between reps? What magic shit happens that if you rest between reps, your muscles don't grow anymore? It's, it's, if anything, it's the other way around. If you do a full lockout and rest between reps, you can get more reps and your muscles get that much more fucked because when they think they're done, they rested just long enough to be able to earn themselves another rep. And guys, will, you'll do mutually contradictory shit. Like, if you constant tension all the time, like, uh-huh. But then I do forced reps too and like drop, drop sets and, and paused reps and shit. Like, uh, so you just do everything. They're like, well, yeah, man, you've got to fucking attack from multiple angles. It's like, sweet. Like, again, you know, a lot of these guys, fine people, maybe some of them are not. Uh, there's just not, there's not, not a lot of thinking going on. It's just a lot of like fucking just let's do shit. You know, I don't know. It's, and Seema, you're a high level jujitsu practitioner. So your eyes have been open to this already. There's two types of people in jiu-jitsu that you can learn from and one type of people you want to learn from. There's the John Danaher side of the spectrum where motherfuckers thought of everything. And there's the just really good Brazilian guy who's just fucking good. And he's like, oh, now you do this. And you're like, why? He's like, you do, just do, do. And you're like, I got you. I, that doesn't make any sense. And I know it works for you because you're wildly athletic and you've been doing this since you were four, but you actually, you're the worst coach of all time. You can't say that to him because he's going to fuck you up because he's a black belt. And also it's not polite. You know what I'm talking about though? And it's just like, people are like, hey, do you, got, do you like what's his name seminar? And you're like, no, I didn't fucking like it. That guy's a fucking idiot. And like, but he won worlds. Like, yeah, by doing this to people, like he's good at that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, so a lot of times people are like, yeah, what do you think about what bodybuilder guy thinks of this and that? I'm like, I don't think the guy thinks much. I, I'm sorry. It's just not a thinker. <laughs> what is full range of motion to you? Can you like describe that? I mean, I think I have a good idea, but just for the listeners, like, are you talking about always locking the elbows in a bench press? Are you talking about always locking the knees, uh, those types of things? That's, that's a really good question. So like to me, full range of motion isn't like a dogmatic or religious concept. It's a concept of, it, it's like a spectrum concept where there's like, if you do this, that's very low on the full range of motion spectrum. If you do this, it's better. So like, I'm not one of these type of guys that'll look at a guy who touches his, uh, the bar to his chest every time and go slightly short of lockout and then back and be like, fucking idiot pussy. He should be locking it out. Like, no, that looks good. Like that's like a 98% on a test or something. It's not a hundred or whatever. But then again, there's some nuance there, right? Like if you lock out, then maybe it transfers force away from the chest. Maybe now it's more of a tricep exercise. Maybe the triceps become the limiting factor. So maybe locking out hundred percent isn't a good idea when you're doing chest presses. I have all the time in the world for nuance. There's a very big difference though, between benching mostly full range and getting a big stretch at the bottom and almost coming up to lock out versus like guys that'll get on the bench, just be like, that shit. Like, no, that, no, inadmissible. That's just stupid. 
right? Like it's the difference between like, like a high level chef was supposed to use paprika, but he used like black pepper and you're like, damn, interesting wine. He's got a good fucking reason for it, even though it's outside of the realm. But if like you watch me cook and I'm like, oatmeal, salt. And you're like, why? Like, don't ask me why I'm a fucking idiot. I can't cook anything. This is a random guess that I promise. I don't even justify it. So it's one of those where like, Full range of motion isn't an absolute concept, but if you're cutting your range of motion, I'd like to know why. So here's another one, right? If you go deep on the leg press, so deep that your hips round out from under you, and now you're hurting in your lower back, it's too fucking deep because it's hurting you, right? But if you go partially on the leg press and I'm like, have you tried going deeper? They're like, uh, do you feel it more or less in your quads if you go deeper? They're like, more. They're like, but you're not going deeper because they're like, cause I can't use as much weight, shitty dog shit reason. Right? So if you're like, look, if I lock out on the bench, transfer the shit to my triceps, I get less of a pec pump, less of a disruption. My pecs get less sore. My elbows hurt. Dude, you sold me. Fuck full range of motion. Go as full as you can while getting the good shit for your pecs and not the bad shit for your joints. But the reasoning has to be there. If there's no fucking reasoning and it's clearly obvious that you're fucking lying to yourself, then, you know, especially when guys like for squats, they make up a ton of reasons. Weightlifters, the world over, over 70 years have been dunking high bar squats and f- they're fine. And you're like, yeah, man, it doesn't agree with my knees. Shut the fuck up. Don't call yourself an athlete. You just don't know how to lift weights. You're a, you're a guy that just does this and you think you know things. Like go train with weightlifters. They'll show you how to do real weightlifting and then you can come back and apply it to bodybuilding. So it's one of those things. If you have a good reason, I'm all fucking ears. The problem is most people don't have a good reason. They have no reason at all. Other than nut hugging, which is probably not a reason. I really like how you clarified. First off, when we first started talking about full range of motion and Mark asked that question, you clarified that it could take six, eight to 12 months to be able to get to doing like a, a, a squat that deep. Because a lot of people immediately, once they see it, they're going to try to squat that low. And then immediately they're either they, they can't get there with their hips or their knees are hurting down there. And they're like, I just don't have the mobility. But you clarified it takes a while to gain that mobility. Totally. And, and the also- more the merrier, as long as it's feeling good for the muscles and feeling okay for the joints. You know, you start at whatever it's like, it's like speaking French. It's not like if you can't speak French perfectly, shut the fuck up and never speak French. Although I guess some French people do think that. Um, but like, you know, like apparently if you go to France and you fuck it up, they're like, do not speak our language. Right. But like in reality, it's like, look, wherever you, whatever French, you know, fine. Just try to learn and do a little better. And over time you speak really good French. Same with like full range of motion, work on it a little bit, make sure you're feeling it in the muscles a lot. And then the joints a little keep going. And over time you'll get to more of a range of motion, which is great. Like I'm not looking at motherfuckers doing leg presses and they're going significantly below peril but not like as deep as they could and like all oh, these fucking idiots i'm like dude that's a pretty fucking good leg press and if they ask me like how can i get better like oh i have tons of ideas but you're doing a great job it's a partial credit sort of thing it's not either or and it takes time to get to you know and i think that brings us it's not actually totally different it's on the same vein for example you know someone can load up a uh, a chest supported row and they could load up five plates and row that shit right um but they're not feeling it in their back. They start feeling in their bicep. They start having to use a lot of body English to bring it back. I'm curious, um, do you have the, the same exact thoughts when you see individuals do that type of stuff? And then also, what, what are some things within training that you'd say, that's just fun shit, like drop sets, maybe loading up a lot of weight and just rocking with it. Um, and then what actually does make sense? So, so within bodybuilding, what are some things that you see a lot of people do, but you're like, eh, that's just fun. It's not really that effective. Yeah. And then what are some other things that you're like, okay, no, that, that is legitimate. Like some people go to failure too often, but you know, there is a place for failure towards maybe the end of a set or an end of a workout. Can we clarify some of that stuff? Yeah, totally. So I think that, you know, we can term something called a mind muscle connection And in real training, that doesn't mean like you feel your bicep. It means one of two things, usually both some measure of both one it, during heavy sets, you feel a disruptive tension, a high degree of tension in your actual bicep or whatever muscle you're training. So if you're doing machine rows, you feel it in your back, like, oh shit. Like someone could be like, do you feel that in your back? You're like, yes. Right. And then for higher rep sets, you feel a distinct burn in your back or whatever muscle you're doing. Can you imagine doing chest presses and someone's like, you got to burn. You're like, yep, my triceps are on fire. They're like, "Mm, what about your pecs? Like, nope. Like, are we confident that the pecs are being overloaded the most? Like, no, they're not even a limiting factor. That's not really a chest press. You can call it that, but it really is just a tricep press at that point. So the mind muscle connection 
is super important to not sacrifice for some other shit. So if you have a movement you're doing with full range of motion, but it reduces the perception of tension to the target muscle or it reduces the burn, then maybe you should limit your range of motion to whatever gives you the most of that. Funny enough, most of the time when you do true full ROM or fuller ROM, you get gnarly fucking mind muscle connection anyway. So the two dovetail a ton. Like imagine doing your you know, chest flies and you open up like fucking crazy at the bottom. You squeeze at the top. Like tell me you're not getting a pump and a burn. Get the fuck out of here. Like, like no, I feel it more like this. No, you fucking don't. Like, you just want to use more weight. Because like we've had tons of people train with us and when we do the full range of motion shit, they look at us like, dude, well, my chest is broken. Like no fucking shit. Like there's no mind muscle connection problem. So for sure, a lot of times when guys are doing that, like low up fly plate, five plates, like you said on the row machine, like a lot of times, like you know, putting in work. Like, do you feel your back? They're like, eh, I don't really feel much of anything. I'm just trying to survive. If you're just moving weight around, it's cool for strong man. It's fine for powerlifting. It's not bodybuilding anymore. You got to be able to feel some shit, tension to the target muscle, or burn. Uh, in the target muscle. And then after a few sets, you should have a robust pump in the muscle that you're training. So you don't have a pump at all. Let's say you're doing rows and you're doing like, like fucking, you know, pigeon dance row where you like just flail around. And someone's like, you got a pump in your upper back. Like mm, I got a pump in my lower back and my glutes. It's like, Hey, I can tell you what you're training right now. And it's not your upper back. Cause why the fuck doesn't it have a pump? You know, it's like doing curls wrong. Someone's like, do you have a bicep pump? You're like, I have a huge forearm pump. It's like, what do you think you're really training at that point? It's like a hint. It's not your biceps so there's definitely that factor and you have to remain true to that before your motion definitely usually helps and that's one of the exceptions if you really do have a lift on which the tension and the burn are maximized at a range of motion that is not full or fuller that's probably a good idea to stay away from full or fuller right like then you have a really good argument and it makes some sense and as for the fun shit versus effective shit the good thing there's like a really wide berth of what's effective in bodybuilding in, in here, really here it is. Make sure that the target muscle is being stimulated, number one. Number two, that it is the limiting factor in the set. So for example, if you are doing pull downs without any straps or chalk, and the reason you get 18 reps and not 22 is that you can't hold the bar anymore. Your forearms give out and someone's like feeling in your lats, right? You're like, eh, honestly, the reason I quit was because I couldn't hold the bar anymore. Like the lats are not the limiting factor. That means they're actually quite far away from failure as a muscle. And most of the best hypertrophy is seen close to failure, right? Within three or four reps away from fail. So you have to make sure the muscle, target muscle is actually a limiting factor. So the muscle is being stimulated, the muscle, the target muscle is limiting factor. And you are generally speaking, training it hard, you're going relatively close to failure. If you hit all three, there's a lot of right answers to that shit. So if you're doing giant sets or drop sets or mile reps, if you're doing them usually non-randomly, which means you do them every week, you progress through them so that you know you're doing a little more each time and you're keeping track, that's the best way to do them. And there's a lot of shit that's just good. People are like, well, when did I do supersets? When should I do my reps? When drop sets? When straight sets? I'm like, is it targeting the muscle? Is the muscle limiting factor? Is it like fatiguing you when you're getting close to failure and afterwards you're like, fuck, that really did some shit. Because if that's the answer, there's a lot of right answers there. So if someone like does a lot of drop sets, my reps, whatever, I'm like, hey, that's great. You know, as long as they can checklist those items and progress logically. And that progress logically is probably an important point because a lot of times people get so into the fun fuckery of lifting they don't know if they're progressing. And a lot of times bodybuilding and hypertrophy is complicated. There's a lot of factors coming in. Like in powerlifting, you can tell if you're fucking progressing just because everyone knows what they bench squat deadlift. And then like, like someone's like, hey, are you getting stronger? Like, it's not a fucking mystery. You're like, uh, yes. So they're like, but when's your last PR? You're like, I don't know. Like, okay, so when you said you were getting stronger, you're just fucking lying. Like, yes, I haven't gotten stronger in years. But for bodybuilding, a lot of guys do like a different machine every time or different range of motion every time or different like, you know, they did straight sets last week. Now they're doing drop sets. You ask them like, hey, it's like, are you getting stronger for reps? And they can't actually give you a reliable answer, which is why consistency is a really good idea. Like, dude, I'll do all the fun shit you want, except do the same kind of fun shit and just progress a little bit each week or each session. And then you can tell like, dude, over the last two months, these like drop sets on leg press, I went from doing 500, 400, 300 for sets of 10, 10, 10 to 550, 450, 350 for 12, 12, 12. Like some shit had to have happened. Like my 99 problems, but training progression is not one of them because in bodybuilding too is high volume. It's really easy to trick yourself into thinking you're working harder and harder, but really because the shit is so hard, it's easy to start coddling yourself. I'll tell you this. Like, so for example, 
you're doing skull crush or super heavy or JM presses, you get to a point if you have strong triceps where like, yeah, 135 feels like it gets you a good pump and shit, but what you need is like 185 and 190 and 195. That's what really makes your triceps grow the most. But you don't want to do that shit. It feels fucking weird. It takes 15 minutes to warm up for it. You got to put on elbow sleeves. You're like, why the fuck am I doing this? Like, let me just train a little easier and justify it with some weird shit. But that's not the way to really make those fucking gains. The way to guarantee gains is to do shit that works and make sure you do a little bit harder every single time or on average. Then there's no like, it's like a quick jujitsu analogy. If you roll with different guys all the time and you don't keep track of points or anything in your head at least, or like what sweeps you're getting, like, I, you know, like someone's like, are you getting better? You're like, I yeah, feel good. How do you know you're getting better? Like you roll against the same good guys in your crew and you're starting to fucking sub more people. You're giving the black belts problems. It's the same guys and you're going up against you, trying the same sweep, same sweep, same sweep. You start getting it. Then you're like, oh yeah, no, I am getting better. This is fucking sweet. You don't have to ask yourself like, man, maybe I've just been lying to myself and going and shitting on blue belts and white belts and uh, pretending I'm getting better. Same idea. There's got to be some kind of like, a lot of guys want to get real fancy and do all kinds of weird shit. They don't want that like, the oppression of a fucking plan. And it, it is oppressive. Like, you're like, okay, last week we did leg press for sets of 20. This week we do leg press again for sets of 20, except with 10 more pounds. You look at your logbook, right? And you're like, I have to beat this? Fuck that. But that's that real shit that guarantees gains. You're like, man, if we could, let's just do leg extension. Let's do hack squat. I feel it more. Lie to yourself. Fuck that. 10 more fucking pounds this week. The week after 10 fucking more pounds. You're not going to want to do it. Your fatigue is crazy high. Fuck that. But that's the shit that guarantees you progress. So yeah, there's tons of the right answers to what works. Do similar shit for one month, two months. Build it up like crazy until you just can't anymore. Deload, pick some different shit keep that shit and then go up again. Do you think a lot of this, uh, a lot of the information uh, that you had to research and the things that you've uh, come across, do you think a lot of these things have been conflated by just meatheads, just grinding it out in the gym and spending three hours in there and they end up kind of doing a little bit of everything. And so it gets to be very hard to tell what the hell works. Cause this guy is saying, oh, I use partial range of motion and I do drop sets and I do, but they do such a wide variety of things. And they've also been lifting for so long that maybe at some point when they first learned how to lift, maybe they had a mentor and they were doing full range and things like that. So do you think that, you know, a lot of the bodybuilders or bodybuilding community maybe has conflated a lot of this information? 100%. And there's a couple problems going on with there. First of all, you say, okay, the way these guys get big is they do partials and shit, ego lifting. They train for three hours a day. Well, maybe they could have done the right shit and only trained for two hours a day and gotten the same results. Mm. Well, then what's, what does that do for their longevity? A really good example is Dexter Jackson. Dexter Jackson's like a thousand years old or some shit, and he's still at it. Like, who knows how old he is? You're like, hey, Dex, what was Abraham Lincoln like? He's like, yeah, a pretty decent guy in real life. You're like, God damn, you are, you are that old. But like, he's rocking it at the highest caliber because like, there's one constant in his training if you see it. It's the least sexy training you've ever seen in your life. He's not yelling at shit. He's not doing dumbass partials. He's doing pretty decent range of motion, controlled, progressive. He doesn't overdo it. That's why he's still in one fucking piece. And a lot of times people try to bring out, I don't talk shit about anyone specific, but people bring up Dorian Yates. That's how you got to train. Dorian he essentially ripped every single muscle off his body by the time he retired in 97. He fucking just destroyed himself. Now, maybe that's the price of victory, but maybe it's not. Jay Cutler never really went to failure did decent range of motion the entire time, did multiple submaximal sets. Jay Cutler had like one injury his entire career. He like tore his bicep before his last Olympia and that was it. Like, that's pretty fucking awesome. And right now, Jay Cutler's healthy as shit walking around. So a lot of it is like, can you get super jacked doing kind of dumb shit? Yeah, you have to do more dumb shit. And here's another really big one. I gotta mention this, survivor bias. Survivor bias is a motherfucker. And it works in at least two ways I can think of in, in high level bodybuilding. One, people who do dumb shit, you look at them and you're like, see, it works for them. Uh -huh. But what about, that, what about that one guy, Mike Powers or whatever, really? Who's that? He was an up and coming national level competitor. You never heard about him? Like, no, he tore both his pecs off his fucking bones because he fucking did the same dumb shit, but he didn't survive. He didn't have the genetics or the sheer luck. 
So you're only looking at survivor pool. It's like looking at guys coming back from World War II and be like, see, war's not dangerous. All these guys came back. Yeah, but you're not counting the guys that never fucking came back. A lot of times, if you look at all the best pros, you're already looking at a filtered sample of the people that survived the dumb shit. You guys know the Bulgarian lifting protocols, right? For weightlifting. Like, like the funniest thing in the world is when, is, is when people freely choose to do Bulgarian in the United States or Europe now. It's like, it's a weeder program. It's designed to crush you. And if you don't get crushed, you win the Olympics once and then you die afterwards or whatever. Why would you do a weeder program for yourself? That's not a good idea. And a lot of times pro bodybuilders, what they do is basically weeder programs that they're surviving. So we think this is a good idea. It's a fine idea, but being that you only have one of yourself, maybe you could do smarter shit because if you get out of the game, that's it for you. It's over. You know what I mean? And just because guys have survived it, that doesn't mean it's going to work for you. And another way that works, and sorry to bring this up if it's not politically correct or whatever, but like gear, like drugs and bodybuilding, because you read like some of it's legit. You read some of the shit the pros are taking, like what's his name's taking eight grams a week. And it's like, see, it didn't kill him. Like, uh uh-huh. And who did it kill? But like, I don't know. Like, exactly, because dead people don't fucking say anything. Like, it could have killed five guys, and there's one in his, like, fucking Russian roulette. One in six fucking, you know, like, five and six die, and he's the only one that made it. You're like, see, it's fucking fine. Like, is it really? Are you going to load that bullet in your gun, right? And I think, at, 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 you know, in eight grams a week, you literally have to shoot yourself full of bullets of testosterone because needles don't work anymore, man. It's just not enough fluid. Uh, what about... Um... I mean, because you're, you're hurting a bunch of people's feelings, you know, your typical gym bro that's trying to do the, uh, the half reps and stuff. Um, and then you kind of, you mentioned something about, about it earlier, but we didn't really dive into it, but assisted reps, um, you know, as far as like having somebody help you, you know, get that last couple of reps so that way you can really squeeze the muscle out. Uh, what's your take on that? I think it's fine in context, but I think it has some downsides. So the upside is like at the end of a mesocycle, like last training session you can use that kind of shit if you have the same training partner doing like eccentric accentuated reps where they help you some on the way up and they don't really help you on the way down you can really squeeze out eccentric reps on pull-ups or some i've done some shit before it does suffer from a tracking problem so you have to address that somehow maybe you track other exercises and not that one you're like i'm going to do five sets of assisted shit i don't really know how big of a stimulus that is but i'm doing pull downs and bent rows and i'm tracking my strength with that so i know my fatigue i know my progress if you do enforce reps on everything, the real question is, and this is like where this is a really great way to abuse the concept. Guys would be like, hit a fucking PR today in the incline, four or five, five. And like, yeah, there's a guy's hands on it the whole time. How much did he help you? And like, well, like, I feel like he helped less than last week. Like, feel, feel, you're betting your progress on feel, you know, like, <laughs> I wouldn't do that. So hey, you can, bro. It was, and he said it was all me. Yeah, he's so a, I, I, I'll he's my friend. <laughs> yeah. So, so basically, like, I think there's a context in which four straps can be good. You just have to be concerned with the downsides and not rely too heavily on them as your number one way of training or not get into the tracking part. Like, if someone's like doing, like, helping you with reps, like, don't write that shit in your logbook. So, for, so here's, here's an example. If you've got eight reps by yourself and four with help, write eight reps by self four with help don't write 12 because then you don't know if that's 12 or is it really 10 so just make sure you note that and then take it with a grain of salt later and then and then you'll know and then next week you're like all right i'm going to do nine by myself and then four with help and then that's progressive overload you know if you're getting stronger you're supplying more of a stimulus and and you're good to go you know i want to know um if you can help some because a lot of listeners are power lifters right their main goal is getting stronger and even though they say their main goal is getting stronger every guy that power lifts also has the goal of looking big and jacked um but like you were talking about at the beginning of this podcast uh, when a lot of guys do that they are also when they're doing their bicep curls and their their pull downs and all of this they're like i want to use as heavy weight as possible to do that so um you know when a power lifter looks at their strength gain you know at the beginning of the training cycle they're able to bench 315 at the end they're able to do 325 or close to 325, right? I got stronger, but they use that same thing and they do that when it comes to bodybuilding. So how can a power lifter that is focused on gaining strength, but also he knows that he wants to gain muscle, how does he have to shift his, his look at his training when it comes to building muscle um, so that he can do it successfully and not just look the same, but be stronger? Yeah, it's a great question. I think 
really, he doesn't have to shift his mindset at all. He has to shift it less than he normally would. I think guys go from powerlifting mode on their core lifts to bodybuilding mode. Let's just fucking rep it out and do partial reps. Keep powerlifting mode, just do more reps. And so powerlifting mode means every rep looks the same. It means you do a full range of motion or at least a predetermined range of motion. And it means you slowly increase the load over time. So like if you're doing lat pull downs, do sets of 15 instead of sets of three to six, like you would for, you know, bench. And then each rep should look the same. You should do, you know, RPE or RIR, the two reps in reserve or whatever on average, and try to add like five pounds every other week to lap pull downs, keep the good technique. And that's it. So actually be more like a power lifter. I think bodybuilders would benefit greatly from standardizing and formalizing the training more like power lifters. Now at the same time, if you really are interested in being jacked just for vanity's sake as a power lifter, because of course, like we said, the answer is definitely yes. You don't want to win the bench meet. You want to be that guy that sits in those stupid chairs they put up for powerlifting, you know, like the row of hotel chairs. You want to be the guy with the lats poking out that people are like, fucking see this guy's lats. Like, yeah, Woody Bench, like, who gives a shit? Look at his lats. Like, that guy's the man. And like, especially if you have like a, like a decent looking girlfriend, then she's oh, super hot by powerlifting meet standards. And then you're really winning at life. You motherfuckers know what I'm talking about. Even in this sport long enough so so you want to be the envy of other powerlifters which is not that hard uh but in any case if you really want muscular development and you're not using a lift to like translate to actual powerlifting like you want bigger lats or some shit or biceps then the mind muscle connection stuff really can play a role so for sure standardize for sure do whatever reps for sure increase load don't fuck yourself over on technique but like when you grip the bar for lat pull downs and you're like yeah this grip i can do lots of weight but I feel it in my biceps and shoulders. But if I do this other grip, I can't use as much weight, but I really get a great lap pump. Probably do that second one. You just be honest about what it is you're doing. Because if you're trying to grow your lats, yes, periodize and progress, but the mind muscle connection should be there. Versus if you're like, I need a pulling movement, which I can get maximally strong on, doesn't really matter where you feel it. You know what I mean? Let's, uh, let's shift gears a little bit. And um, can you tell us about, you know, what the research says in terms of, worked out kind of the peri nutrition type stuff i know people get uh really deep into it i personally have been using amino acids during training for i don't know 20 years or so and uh i've utilized some carbohydrates during training and had some success with it it quote unquote feels good uh i don't know what it's actually doing or what it's not doing but it does feel like it helps me to uh kind of finish the workout with a little bit more oomph and so I wanted to kind of get your thoughts and uh, on that. I've heard you talk about it in some ways that are really simple that I haven't heard other people talk about it. And in kind of saying, look, if you are eating carbohydrates throughout the day, it probably really doesn't matter that much. And so I'd love you to kind of expand upon some of that. Yeah. If you have multiple meals of, if you have a nice high carbohydrate series of meals or even meal before training and you have a meal, bro, let's consume after protein and carbs. I mean, from a, uh, signaling process perspective from an actually getting the muscle to grow and supplying the raw materials for it to grow, you're really checking a whole lot of boxes. However, workouts that last longer than more, workouts which push you psychologically, if you have a sweet during, preferably one with some protein and carb, you can, first of all, just taste to take meat can uh, make you perform a little bit better. Uh, and second of all, if you do take in some protein and carbs during the longer workouts, it doesn't really do much for your first couple of sets or exercises. But like you said, it's that tail end ability to finish on a strong note, which actually does improve a bit. So if you're one of these situations where you do your, let's say you do squatting, benching, and then you do some lats and biceps. If you have a protein and carb shake with you, you start sipping it halfway through the workout. Usually when you get, you guys know, like when you get to lats and biceps and you're a power lifter, you look at your training partner and you're like, fuck are we still doing here? And he's like, I don't know, let's just skip it. Or let's just, you know, what is it like mail it in, right? Like we're going to do lats, but we're not going to do, like I'm not going to try. You know? um, and then, you know, if you do have that carbohydrate shake with some protein in it and some fluids, a good hydration, maybe a little bit of salt, what ends up happening is, is you can just put that little extra exclamation mark on the lats and the biceps at the end and walk out of the gym. You're like, dude, we fucking, you know what I'm saying? We did due diligence to that shit. We actually progressed. We actually did a good job. And that can add up over time. And especially guys that train with longer workouts 
well, you know, sometimes you have the psychological energy to do a good workout anyway, but sometimes you don't. And, you know, that's where pre-workout comes in really handy. And in addition to that, a carbohydrate and protein blend uh, that's fast digesting with plenty of fluid, start drinking it like during a workout or sipping out it halfway through your workout. And it really can cap off the end of the workout really well. Cause you figure like, yeah, okay. The, the beginning of the workout's more important anyway, you know, 200 workouts in, if you had pretty good ends of your workouts, it's going to matter. It's going to make a difference in hypertrophy and strength over time. You know, when it does, what, uh, what kind of amount are we talking about? You think that would make a, make a difference? I'm sure it depends on someone's size, but for me personally, I noticed that I don't need a lot of carbohydrates, like uh, 25 to 50, like mm -hmm. that's, usually, that's really usually does the trick. Yep. For the average, like lifting size male and something like a scoop of protein, 25 grams, maybe even half that. Nobody's going to half scoop. Nobody listens to that shit. So scoop of protein and then 25 to 50 grams of carbs for a real hard workout. Uh, what you want to do is make sure it's in a roughly 8% solution, right? So that, that, that basically means like if you have 80 grams total of protein plus carbs, you want that in like at least a liter of water, right? So it should be pretty diffuse and it should feel like it's hydrating you. What you don't want is like, you got, you know, people put a shitload of protein and carbs into like a mini shaker and they, yeah, they drink it and they're like, nah, 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 I need like to fucking, I need a gallon of water to wash this down now. That actually prevents it for, through your muscles from your GI tract and it, it might slow you down, it might bloat you up. Um, what you want to do is have plenty of water along with that. So it kind of tastes like almost diluted Gatorade. Um, hilariously enough, the original Gatorade formula, the one that worked best for rehydration, was like half of the carbohydrate content and double the water as modern Gatorade. Like modern Gatorade is an entertainment drink. Like you drink it because it tastes good. You can think of who is on a market for Gatorade? trucker i think like people that go into gas stations get a candy bar and a fucking gatorade it's like what event are you getting ready for we just want sugar water it tastes good so if you have like gatorade or whatever dilute it by half or if you put in your own carbs eight percent solution it's not going to taste amazing it's going to taste like like semi-sweet and then it actually hydrates you actually boosts performance so on and so forth so uh, i wish it, it was kind of like you know what's the bodybuilding food that makes you most jacked like it's not fucking pizza uh, so sometimes taste can, can lie to you. I know, I know it sucks. It's actually lucky charm cereal in SEMA. So you're, you're totally good to go. It's even better than pizza as far as you're concerned. You know, Dr. Mike, within the same vein of like, um, I guess getting bigger since we were talking about this, um, a lot of our listeners follow different styles of diet. There's some listeners that are keto, some listeners that do carnivore, some listeners that, uh, use carbohydrates or quite a bit of them along with fats and protein. Now, if an individual is trying to gain muscle and let's say that protein is the same, but, uh, and calories are the same, uh, but one individual chooses to utilize more carbohydrates, uh, you know, moderate fat, low fat, more carbohydrates and another individual is like, I would like to be really high, high fat and low carbohydrate. What are in the context of muscle gain, the, uh, advantages or disadvantages of both? So that our listeners, like if some are doing really high fat keto style diets, maybe they'll think about adding some carbohydrates into their diet for gaining muscle. Yeah. Carbohydrates potentiate the ability of the nervous system to work better so that you can push your muscles harder. So they improve uh, your ability to work out. Carbohydrates replenish your intramuscular stores of energy called the glycogen so that they make repeat workouts day after day after day, session after session, week after week better. Carbohydrates, when they fill up glycogen, glycogen has a direct link to your cells, muscle growing machinery. So when you're full with glycogen, you actually just sit around and grow more muscle than if you're glycogen depleted. Um, in addition to that, the insulin secreted along with any eaten carbohydrates is wildly anti-catabolic. It prevents muscle loss, which we all go through periods of catabolism at various points during the day. And if you can reduce that, the net muscle gain is actually a thing. And carbohydrates in non-insulin using natural athletes are a little bit anabolic too. So over time that adds up. So the argument for carbohydrate fueled massing is twofold. One, it makes real good technical sense. Two, there are not so many universals in bodybuilding practice because a lot of shit works if you do it real hard. Mm -hmm. um, high carbohydrate dieting, putting on more muscle is a damn near universal. Even stupid bro bodybuilders figure that shit out. And it's almost something that's never violated. Um, the number of people that got jacked, jacked doing keto or carnivore, I don't know any off the top of my head. 
Uh, and now, can you get lean doing that shit? Fuck yeah. Can it be a really good part of a healthy, sustainable diet? Absolutely. Is it going to make you maximally jacked? Probably not. And carbs will be an advantage. So that doesn't mean you have to eat like that forever. If you don't really like carbs all that much, just try eating some more of them and, and it'll help. Uh, and then if you go back to your lower carb lifestyle afterwards, do it after you've gained some muscle. So try higher carbs for 12 weeks, pound those weights, you get more jacked and then go back to lower carbs for a while if that's the lifestyle that you like. Um, but at the end of the day, almost everyone ever who's gotten really, really big has done so with a considerable amount of carbs. If you need inspiration on this matter, just Google Jay Cutler's diet. Um, it is really obscene. Um, there's an interview with him during contest prep where he, they're like, what's your favorite cheat meal? He's like, I, I don't have a favorite cheat meal. If I could get a cheat meal, it would be to just skip a meal. I hate eating. I do it every waking second. And he would have like, he would diet on a thousand grams of carbs a day. Uh, I mean, that's just insane, right? I don't know what he masked on. I can't even imagine that shit. But like, that's what it took to get Jay Cutler big. And every other big bodybuilder you've ever heard of, uh, pretty much did, did it on lots and lots and lots of carbs uh, as it works. I'll add to that as well. Like just my, in my own experience, um, like, you know, I've been a proponent of a uh, low carb lifestyle for a long time, just cause it helps me to, uh, stay away from overeating. Cause I just love carbs. And then once I start eating them, I want more of them. And the next thing you know, it's like crap. I'm, uh, yeah. I'm at the bottom of a fucking Ben and Jerry's uh, bucket. Right. But what I'll say is that even, um, even a minor amount of carbohydrates, like even just, uh, just, I don't know, having a fucking potato and having rice, like just having like, I don't know, maybe two servings of carbohydrates a day um, in reasonable amounts. I mean, I've, I've had a lot of success. I feel like uh, with changes in my own body of just having like a hundred to 200 carbs a day, not getting big, you know, not getting huge, uh, but I am about 245 pounds. So not small either. <laughs> and uh, I think that, um, a lot of people can really gain a lot from that. So the people that are doing keto and carnivore and stuff like that, I think that you can switch, you know, switch some of your fat calories for a little bit of carbohydrates. And yes, you won't be officially carnivore and maybe you won't be officially keto, uh, but you'll look a lot better and you won't look like a wet noodle. You'll actually be jacked and start to have some veins coming through your arms. Yeah, man, it, it just fucking works. And Maybe a bit of advice for folks that are interested in like sort of making that leap is don't just go to Ben and Jerry's. I mean, what am I saying? Of course, go to Ben and Jerry's. It's delicious. Um, but on a serious note, like if you're straight up keto or carnivore and you're like, all right, I'm going to mass, I'm going to eat more carbs, start with eating more greens and some more fruits. I mean, for the love of God, you're not going to zone out and just cons consume 500 grams of Swedish fish just because you had an apple. She's like, oh, okay, that's fine. And then, you know, have some fruit, have some whole grains like oatmeal and like, like, yeah, look, carbs make you want more carbs unless you have like barely flavored oatmeal. People are like, are you carb crazy now? You're like, I don't know. I just kind of tired of eating oatmeal. So whole grain bread. And then eventually you can work up to like brown rice and whole grain pasta. And then all of a sudden you're eating like lots of carbs. And someone's like, are you carb crazy now? You're like, not really. It's not really carbs that make you crazy. It's super fucking amazing tasting foods which carbs just happen to be a big fucking part of, you know, like it's easy to eat two boxes of sugary cereal. But if I'm like, yeah, Hey, eat the same amount of carbs and oranges. You're like, what? That's like 900 oranges. Like, yeah. Like but I eat three oranges. I can't eat for another four hours. Like, uh, like, ah, oh, man, it's not the carbs, I guess. So uh, yeah. Tasty, super fucking delicious foods are a motherfucker and carbs just happen to be involved in a lot of shit. What's the deal with your bread pudding? It's a very charitable way to describe what I eat because it almost subsumes that there's a recipe for it. So basically, like, I'm at the tail end of a diet. I've been dieting for, like, 19 weeks at this point. I have, like, striations and veins in my ass, which you're not supposed to have. It's not, it's not yeah, right? Like, why? And my body is, like, waking me up at night, and it's like, you're fucking up. Eat. And, like, I'm hungry 100% of the time that I'm awake. So I, because I get real preset macros, I got to try to crush that shit with food that is filling and nutritious, but doesn't send me down that roller coaster of, oh my God, this is so amazing. I just want more of it, right? And my standard of what is good has dropped like you fucking wouldn't believe. Like 
I'm in a standard of eating where if I was like a standard of like, I'm just going to throw this off the rails. Fuck it. Masturbation wise, I'm at like the 13 year old in 1998 standard where you find like a crumpled piece of porn art on the, on the floor. You're like, this is amazing. <laughs> Holy shit. I'm not at like a porn hub HD standard. We're like, Oh yeah, this isn't the fucking, if this isn't a pay site, I'm not even trying it. like pathetic levels. You guys remember, I don't know. And see you might be too young for this shit. Like the blurry cable where like a nipple pops out and you're like, this is the greatest day of my life. I'm at that standard for food I remember that. right now. <laughs> yeah. hundred percent. Right. Like that was, you know, that was scrambled, so, scrambled porn, scrambled porn amazing but, it, but there was some kind of mystery about it too that was like it was the it was the like is hey, it really it gonna happen right yeah and it's like you know now like porn habit shit's guaranteed i don't want my shit guaranteed i want the fucking the chase i don't know if it's really chase but in any case so what i end up doing is i make like casein pudding which people keep asking me the recipe motherfuckers is casein and water mixed together into a fucking sludge and then I have whole grain bread that's low calorie because it's fucking low calorie and it's filling and it's not very good. And I put the fucking pudding on the bread and it makes me less sad. Uh, and if you try it and you're not dieting, you're going to be like, this is the worst thing ever. Just like if you've had Pornhub for forever and you look at scrambled cable porn, you're going to be like, this is for stupid people. And you're completely right. But when you're a starving man, you'll do weird shit. And, and that's where I am. Dude, just give us the goddamn recipe, okay? <laughs> I just did. Water, casein, bread, spread around. No, seriously. <laughs> okay, okay, write this down. Now, there's some cooking involved. And you have a degree in food science? Because I'm going to throw some terms you guys won't understand. <laughs> Oh, he, he's not going. <laughs> no, there's no, that's the punchline, guys. There's no recipe. Boom. <laughs> I mean, that, that I guess that, that shows our IQ right there. We're all just like, yes, yes. What go is on. It? Like, no, no, I don't know how to cook. <laughs> um, I, we, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was gonna say we, we, uh, we got some questions from Instagram, but it's a little bit. Uh, off topic. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Trust me. But Mark, if you had some more nutrition things, we can keep talking about that. Yeah, I got one more, kind of one more, uh, mm -hmm. just kind of on, on the topic of uh, protein. And you talked about, you know, shoving down like four oranges and there's a lot of carbohydrate type foods that are fibrous that can help keep you full. Um, I found for myself, like something like a baked potato, uh, keeps me more in line with, uh, not overeating than rice because if I combine rice with certain things and I just want to keep fucking eating, like what? um, what's that? Oh, just if I combine it with like meat or something, like I just, I just want to, you know, I just have a hard time with portion sizes. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but I noticed with increased protein and especially over a period of time, um, I've been consuming, you know, 300 and sometimes even 400 grams of protein. I've kind of settled more into a 300 gram range, but after doing that for a few weeks and experimenting with protein leveraging, um, it has really helped me. It's helped control my hunger and uh, has assisted me. So I wanted to see, you know, what you've seen in the research in terms of uh, just consuming a lot of protein and trying to uh, utilize that as like a weapon or a tool to help keep overall calories managed. Yeah, that works really well. And it's really well vetted in the literature. Up to like a gram per pound for sure works, maybe a little bit higher, much more than that. So you weigh like 245. If you ate much more than 300, if you went to like 350, 400, 450, it's not as reliable that you would get like an anti-hunger effect, but up to about 250 to 300 in your case, grams of protein a day. But yeah, that'll be way, way, way a uh, big anti-hunger effect versus if you try like 200 or 150 a day. So consistent, high protein feedings are definitely a really good way. And, and the texture and stuff matters and the digestion speed. So you want things like casein protein, things like eggs and egg whites, things like meats. If you just do whey protein and stuff, that tends to digest so quickly that you're just fucking hungry right after. It also has like an insulin boosting thing, which can sort of zap all the nutrients out of your blood. And all of a sudden you're like, fuck, I feel like I haven't eaten shit. So keeping protein high and keeping mostly from slower digesting animal sources is a really good, good fucking policy. You know, so a lot of the IFB pros and shit, they eat like inordinate amounts of protein. Like we're talking about guys your size eating 400, 450 grams of protein a day. They say like all oh, the drugs, let me process all that. And that's really sure that's the case because feed efficiency also goes up. 
So it kind of counterbalances. I'm not sure what, what's behind that other than maybe just overkill. Um, Cause you know, you tell a guy protein's good and he's very sweet. I'll just eat double what the fucking recommendation is. Um, so I'm not sure if there's a real place for that, although potentially there is, but definitely like a gram per pound to a gram, like 1.25 grams per pound per day uh, is really, really good uh, anti-hunger strategy. If you're not doing that, you could be highly benefiting because a lot of people that do keto, low carb, et cetera, they'll try to get into this magical state of ketosis by eating a super high fat and a low amount of protein because like it keeps me away from generating, you know, so sort of glycolytic elements and stuff and it keeps me truly in ketosis. It's not really that magical about being truly in ketosis for most people. I would, would just recommend for those people to cut their fats a little bit, raise their proteins quite a bit, and all of a sudden they get a better anti-hunger feel and they're still mostly in ketosis most of the time. You know, in that, uh, within, since we're talking about protein, I'm curious, uh, you know, you made a video on meal timing recently, which was awesome, by the way, if you guys haven't checked it out, you have a whole series that's pretty damn great of lectures, but, um, I'm wondering for individuals who are like, you know, I don't like to space out my meals during the day. I like to eat, uh, two meals a day. Some people eat all their calories in one meal each day, but when we're talking specifically about protein, um, and muscle growth, uh, there have been. Like, I think there's research that shows advantages to even protein feedings during the day versus yeah. big bowls of protein once a day. But you can't store protein, correct? No, not, not in the way you can store fat and carbs. You know? And I'm curious, do you think the difference is that substantial where if a person like they like, they still eat the same amount of protein, but they like doing it in lower feedings versus even feedings during the day, is it substantial enough for this person to try to change their lifestyle if they're like, yeah, if they're not trying to head towards the stage, that's what I'm wondering. Like, do you think it's something that people should still try to do if they don't really, if they're still getting the same amount of protein? Yes. Good question. So it, it, it depends on like also how interested you are in maximizing your physical fitness and your sport participation and things like that. But I would say like, if you're eating two to three times per day, uh, is it worth it to bump to four to five times per day? If you're headed for the stage, yes. Mm -hmm. If you're headed for trying to maximize, remotely maximize your uh, athletic performance and muscularity, yes. If you're just a regular dude who's just trying to be healthy and fit, just doesn't want to be a fat piece of shit, goes to the gym four times a day or four times a day, four times a week, and just is like just wants to be fit and healthy, do two or three portion feedings is totally fine. It'll get you like 90% of all the shit you want. Uh, but if you're like, oh, like, you know, my last jiu-jitsu tournament, I took third, but I really want to take first, like, four to five meals per day because you, you want to be able to have done everything that's at least obviously beneficial uh before you consign yourself to being like i'm just a second or third place type of motherfucker like yeah you know like maybe you can try a little harder um but uh, on the other end one protein feeding per day you're giving up a lot you know and if you're involved in a fitness lifestyle and you're making sort of like any other attempt to increase your muscularity through weight training and the proper diet for the love of god you can do better than one. Uh, and I think at that point, like at least two or three, like three, you can fucking eat protein three times. And it, it's this, you can have two big meals a day, but then have a tiny meal of protein only. Uh, like for example, you wake up in the morning, have a casein protein shake, 75 grams of casein. Then for lunch, have your normal big lunch meal and then have your normal big dinner. That's three meals, three spreading uh, boluses of protein, you're super fucking well on your way. But if you like literally have one meal a day with all protein, carbs and fats in it, uh, I don't think you're trying, you're not trying. Um, and yeah, you are definitely trading off something significant. And if you call yourself, if you call what you're doing an attempt at the fitness lifestyle, I don't know, co color me crazy. Uh, but I, I don't think, I, I think there's, there's more wiggle room there. It, it's kind of like, you know, if you're saying like you're really interested in health, but you, you drink like, you know, two bottles of vodka every other day, someone could be like, yeah, yeah, yeah feel you you ever drink by maybe drinking less vodka They're like no nah, it's okay like yeah it's not <laughs> then maybe if you can drink like two or three shots of vodka every other day like no nah, okay fine that's fine right like it's plenty of healthy russians that do that but two or three bottles every other couple of days it's like i feel like you're not really interested in health and you're just going to drink vodka one way or the other which again is totally fine yeah for myself uh i was doing a lot of fasting for a while and then i ditched that and i was eating breakfast and then uh I switched to just having like a protein shake just cause I just, I just didn't feel like eating in the morning. And Me I was either. like, this is a good, this is a good way of, of keeping it simple and making sure that I am getting protein cause you can't really store protein the way that you can store fat and carbohydrates, as you mentioned. And it's a way for me to keep my size and 
I don't know, keep everything going the way that I want it to. And then usually I work out at like 10 o'clock and then I have my intra workout stuff and post workout, I start eating and uh, it seems to be working, working well. So anyone that's looking for, you know, some, something to try, you might want to just try a protein, a protein shake in the morning, real simple, easy. They taste good. That's a good way of doing it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. A lot of times that's the way I eat is like in the morning, I don't really eat much, but I will have a protein shake and it starts me off pretty well. Yeah, the, uh, what the you got, one, Andrew? Yeah, well, actually, now you, get, you brought up an, another question I had in mind. The last time we had you on, I asked you about like a bodybuilding pizza. Um, since then, I've been kind of diving more into some of these like tricks or some of these hacks or better known as the anabolic diet by... Uh, made popular by your, your buddy, Greg Doucette. <laughs> um, He's what, what, yeah. And so I, I followed uh, his diet. Well, actually it was for my buddy Remington James cause he has a recipe book and I followed that for a photo shoot and I did, I did okay. I did pretty good. Um, but then I started following the RP diet with the RP diet app. And I instantly noticed that I couldn't have any more of my little tricks. You know, I couldn't have any of the uh, like the big, you know, anabolic ice cream shakes in the blender with the uh, xanthan gum. Um, I couldn't have a lot of like, uh, like fake sugars and all these, these weird oddball things because the app forced me to have whole foods. Um, if we're talking about just getting in more protein, uh, staying in a caloric deficit or at maintenance, is there anything in your opinion really wrong with some of these other like different types of types of diets that maybe not necessarily have whole foods in them, but they're more of like a kind of like if it fits your macros type of thing. That's totally cool. Mm -hmm. The RP diet is going to be getting more advanced and incorporating more. I I FYM approach if people want that. Mm -hmm. So it's updates are coming where it's a bit more flexible and then eventually very flexible. But one of the things about the RP diet is like, we actually want to inculcate habits for people to eat like decent fucking whole food shit because that not just gets you in shape but builds healthy habits you can use the rest of your life and keeps you healthy um because like you can eat all that weird shit and there's totally a place for it but like that's not really building a diet you know like you're not eating xanthan gum for the rest of your fucking life you know uh you can i guess <laughs> but you know like that that stuff is really great for like if you're deep in a hole when you need some shit to fill you up that doesn't have a lot of calories and you need something sweet and all those recipes are awesome for that. But once you return back to relatively normal eating, it's good to be able to be just put together basic meals that are healthy and have really great ingredients and check all the boxes. So, but there's, so there's nothing wrong at all with all those other diets. Those other diets are just a little bit more temporary than something like the RP diet, which is a bit more of a lifestyle or at least sets you up for more of a lifestyle. Yeah, that, that's definitely what I noticed right away too. I was just like, wow, like I, I, didn't realize I wasn't eating, you know, like n normal foods, like at all period, you know, but I was, I, I was hitting my, my macros, you know, almost every single day and I was, I was having success, but you're right. I guess maybe that would be a really good temporary uh, solution, but um, we do have some questions from Instagram. Um, don't worry. I won't give you anything too like low hanging fruit. Feel but, free. Uh, yeah. Our, our buddy, Josh Settledge, he's a, a jujitsu practitioner as well. He rolls with Encima and uh, he's just curious if any of your workouts have any intentional carry over into jujitsu from what you're doing right now with your bodybuilding. Zero. <laughs> Not a answer. I love it. <laughs> you know, okay. I, I, hopefully I, you can expand on that, but um, I love it when I guess I see individuals or I see people post this workout is specific for jujitsu, et cetera. Um, and it's some weird ass movement that's very hard to progress. And it's just like, you just wonder why. Now, my question to you, adding on to Josh's question is for those jujitsu practitioners, do you think there's any need to add in specific things into your training outside of getting stronger and potentially getting bigger um, that you know, is special for the martial art or should they just train like i mean there's going to be some back offs because of fatigue but should they just train like everybody else in a sense in a sense absolutely so a good great resource if you guys want to have mine to show chad wesley smith the juggernaut he's put out a ton of great shit about jiu-jitsu and how to train for it and it's so funny because you look through his videos and he has like some Instagram previews from his YouTube content and he's like the four pillars of jujitsu lifting and you're like, whoa, it's going to be advanced. And he's like pulling, squatting, pressing, rowing. You're like, God damn it. It's the yeah. same shit. But, and then you realize you're like the carries, you can do some carries and stuff. But like at the end of the day, it's mostly 
what is it that you're lifting weights for in jujitsu? It's to get strong because strong is inconvenient. Mm -hmm. That's it. You want to become inconvenient for people. They want to do things to your body and you're too strong to let them. And when you do things to their body, you're strong enough to do things to their body that they don't want. You you know, put it this way. So you take two guys and they have the same technical skill, like same belt rank, and you know they're roughly the same technically. One guy say, dude, in the last like couple of years, he's been doing all this functional stuff, like weird vice gripping. He does pull-ups with like a gi uh, roll down the shit, you know, and like he does a lot of core work, functional stability shit. Like you gonna roll with him? Like, yeah, I'll take a shot at the title, fine. But then another guy, you're like, hey, that guy is like, you know, also a purple belt or whatever. I'm like, okay, sweet. Like he's been doing a lot of powerlifting. He's like pulled 600 bench, 400 and squat of like 585 ass to grass. I'd be like, yo, fuck that guy. I don't want to roll with that guy. Like that's a lot of guy to roll with, you know? And you're like, you can see me, you competed against Chad. Like that's not fun. And you're like, I just hope he doesn't kill me or, or eat me or whatever. And you are that guy too, where you're posting crazy numbers and you're super high skilled. Nobody wants to roll with you. You probably have trouble getting super fights because they're like, well, fuck that guy. I don't want to. So at the end of the day, I mean, you see, know, think about it this way. Can you imagine someone like Brian Shaw at a mid-level blue belt skill level? Would you roll with that guy? I fuck that. Fuck that. You couldn't, I don't know what you could do to him. He could pretzel your ass up. Cause like when a guy pulls 1100, man, there's a lot of jujitsu just goes down the window. Like one of my instructors said, if you like pin someone straight to the ground, like over under top side pin, he's like, oh, don't be down there. There's a no, no, a lot of jujitsu down there. It's like literally just jujitsu runs out when you're like, someone's on your face. You're like, I can't use my body. <laughs> so you know, the, the idea of strength training for jiu-jitsu is to become inconveniently strong and in just core basic pushing, pulling movements that uh, then your technique takes over and you use this new cool, strong body in a way that's jiu-jitsu specific. But fundamentally, jiu-jitsu specific weight training, there are a couple of places where, yeah, you can do some specificity, but for the most part, just want to get brutally strong at the main compound movements. That's it. Like if you, if you could watch a guy like, uh, and, you know, there's some movements, like here's an example, more specific movement that still works. You know, the ab roll out thing, like mm -hmm. the ab roller. If you watch a guy ab roll with like 135 for a set of 10, that guy can sit up in the guard and fucking jam you down faster than you can blink because he's got so much core strength that you're like, dude, that's going to be a tough roll. Like shit like that. So even when you do the fancier looking lifts, you got to progress and just get fucking inconveniently strong on them shits. Because a lot of times jiu-jitsu guys will have a great base of technique and then they get into lifting and they trust the wrong people. All of a sudden they're doing BOSU ball bullshit and one leg balancing shit. And I'm like, what do you think that's getting you? It's funny. You watch um, Gordon Ross Ryan and his crew who are best in the world, how do they train? They train like bodybuilders. They just get really big, really strong muscles. The rest of the shit technique handles. Like you never see Gordon Ryan doing BOSU ball shit. He does like bench presses and rows. And that makes him really annoying because <laughs> you just can't move him like you want to. So at the end of the day, that's absolutely the case, man. And there's so, I mean, you know, the community super well, the layers of bullshit of resistance training for jujitsu are like infinite. It's like Dante's levels of hell. There's just a new layer of like people making shit up. Like, well, what you want is like, shut the fuck up, which, and I love, like, I'm not even that good at jujitsu. I love rolling like at other people's new gyms and just like inconveniently like, stack passing and toothpasting the fuck out of people. And then like, a guy's legit asked me like, so do you think like your muscles like help you in jujitsu? I'm like, Dude, I just rolled through you and you're a four strike brown belt. What do you think, man? Did I do anything crazy technical? Did I trick you? They're like, no. I'm like, like they're, why couldn't you triangle me? Because I'm too strong to triangle and I'm too physically big, like, right? So if you were bigger and stronger, wouldn't that be nice? And they're like, yeah, but I need to be specific to jujitsu. I'm like, I get the fuck out of my face. Or let's just roll again and maybe I'll beat your ass again and then maybe you can learn. Maybe not. You know, one thing though that does also, I guess, um, come into play from what you were talking about at the beginning of our whole conversation when it comes to lifting. I think uh, jujitsu individuals would get a great benefit from doing full range of motion because I see some jujitsu oh, people, that, right? Um, and they do partial ranges. But like, if you think about the nature of the sport, you're being put in so many weird positions. You got to push from here. So you want to press from there, right? So I think that's one thing Crazy. that you talked about that is going to be so, that can be one of the biggest things that helps jujitsu guys lift. Totally. I mean, like full range bent rows, pull ups, 
deep ass squats, lunges where you somehow like put the knee below the ground or like elevated leg. You're going to be in positions where people put you in them. You don't want to be in them shits. You're going to want to be strong in all the worst possible positions. Like skull crushers, people do them like right here. When I lay on your ass, you're going to be skull crushing beyond your face. If you're strong from here, you get the party started. If you, if I put you down here, you're like, oh shit, I've never been here before. You're getting smeared. And then what? Like there's zero excuse for partial range of motion lifting as applied to jujitsu. People still do it because they're fucking egotistical because full range of motion is hard. And because their coach says like, oh, it's okay. Like we're going to make it functional or whatever. Great. And I hope you run into someone like Gordon Ryan, who's stronger than you and more technical, pulls your asshole out of your mouth. And then you can go back and just do more Bosu ball shit and say like he's using drugs. That's why he beat me. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> it's a pretty sweet submission if you've never seen it done. It's cool. Is that legal? Maybe. Oh uh, yeah, at ADCC. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Mr. Shellshock asks if you're ever going to have any uh, jujitsu strength and conditioning templates. Uh, to exactly to Encima's point, we have what's called the simplified templates at RP, the simplified training templates. And it's like a four day program of pushing, pulling, squatting, et cetera. That's the jujitsu templates. Just use them shits. They're cheap, they're basic, and they're gonna take you 90% of the way. Are we eventually gonna have a more detailed product? Uh, maybe, uh, but like not for a while. But the good thing is, is you don't need that shit nine times out of 10. Just our basic templates will cover you. Fuck RP, fuck buying our shit. Go get it anywhere else. Ju Juggernaut Method 2.0. With like it, fucking for the love of God and Seema offers coaching, fucking hire him. Just hire someone not fucking imbecilic and do compound basics. Any fucking powerlifting program is a great start. Just do that shit. I think, and that's part of the thing. Like no offense to the question asker. Right? You're asking a very legit question, but like you don't need a jujitsu specific fucking template. Like you may need it if you're like up in the upper crust of getting to be a world champ but then you don't need a template. You need a coach. You need to hire a seaman. He needs to take you the rest of the way with a personalized program because up until then, you could just use really basic templates to just get fucking cock strong because if you hire a seaman, if you hire someone like Chad Wesley Smith and you come to them already squatting, benching, deadlifting, and pulling up raw legit numbers, they're going to be like, dude, our job is easy as fuck. I'm just going to manage your fatigue, find out what lifts work best. That's easy, but can you, can you imagine inheriting, and I'm sure you've done this, you inherit a good grappler, you're like, all right, well, let's get you to train with weights. And he like benches 115 for a set of five. And you're like, you have no idea how weak you are. How the fuck are you this good? And on the bright side is like, if he actually buys in for a few years, he's going to get way better because he's going to get way stronger. But on the downside, and I'm sure you, you've been in this, in this situation, a guy will hire you like six weeks before Worlds. And he's like, I need strength and conditioning. And you're like, uh-huh. And he's like, here's my numbers. And you're like, I don't know what we're going to do in six weeks that's not just going to hurt your body. Just continue to smoke cigarettes or whatever you do for your current strength and conditioning program. Hit me up after Worlds. would take one year to actually make you strong. I've been in a situation before where I've worked with some pretty high level guys and I'm like, holy fuck, are we getting out of a deficit here? You know, so just the basics, man. You know, I do want to mention something real quick. The guy who asked the first question, Josh Settledge, he's a very strong grappler, um, very strong guy. He's a blue belt, but he works with a lot of like top level competitors. If you guys check out his Instagram. So check Josh's Instagram out because he has a lot of great jujitsu content, but he also works with a lot of grapplers, which is awesome. But Dr. Mike, what I wanted to ask you also, um, since we're kind of on this topic, is you personally, and I think Chad made a great video about this um, on his- Chad made a video about me talking shit? Not you talking shit, but like a lot of, a lot of grapplers, um, they're like, you know, how do I balance jujitsu and lifting? I think honestly, the big idea of that video that Chad made is you just need to figure out your hierarchy of importance. Like, are you someone who's doing jujitsu as a hobby, but you're focused on bodybuilding? Well, there are ways to do this. And you also made a video about this. And, you know, I think you're a great example because bodybuilding is your thing, right? Absolutely. But you also love training jujitsu. So for, for yourself, focusing on getting bigger, focusing on putting on as much muscle as possible. How do you change up your training of jujitsu so you can still get the most out of your training in the gym? Yeah, I just made a big change actually. So what I used to do is typically train three or four days a week in jujitsu. And that training was, I have a coach, Josh Vogel in Philadelphia. Uh, his Instagram is uh, at the sloth, uh, the sloth report. So really Josh is like a mystery of, uh, 
it's taken my back so many times in three seconds that I'm like, I, I don't know anything. I'll roll with it. I'll like, I'll like shit out a couple black belts and I'm like, I'm the man. And I'll roll with Josh who weighs 150 pounds and I'm like score zero points. And I'm like, I, I don't know anything. People are like, do you, you do later? Someone asked that day, like you do jujitsu, right? And I like roll with Josh. I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> I used to think I did. But anyway, Josh is my coach. So he sets the plan for me. And then I come and roll. Uh, I do like basically like four, three or four sessions of five or six live rolls uh, doing executing certain specific plans. And I used to do that up until several months ago. And then several months ago, I made the decision to like focus quite a bit more bodybuilding. So now I've taken my jujitsu training for the foreseeable future down to two sessions a week, still four to six rolls each time, but I'm not trying as hard in those roles. Uh, they're a little bit more technical, a little less uh, because I need to save myself. So that's how I'm adjusting. And then if I get closer to bodybuilding competitions or to peaks of mass gaining, I'll go into that two easy rolls or easy sessions per week range. And if I'm away from that or have different priorities away from bodybuilding, then I'll go back up to three or four uh, rolling sessions of harder jujitsu. I won't be doing that second thing for a while now because I'm really trying to put it into bodybuilding. But I think between those two extremes, many grapplers can find where they want to be. It's just like you said, it's a matter of figuring out your priorities your hierarchy of importance and understanding the fundamentally the MRV concepts, maximum recoverable volume, you can only do so much. And where you put your training, where you put your recovery is up to you and it's not infinite. So like I think a lot of guys, they power lift six days a week and they're like, I'm starting to do jujitsu. I'm going to add four sessions. They're like, no, you're not. <laughs> and in two weeks later, you won't be adding shit. You'll be pe peeling yourself off, off the ground. So it's a matter of understanding your limits and then working within them and sometimes doing more of one thing, sometimes more of the other. You know, even to add on to that, if you have enough self-discipline for this, I definitely don't. But if you're someone who's focused on strength training and bodybuilding and you do want to do jujitsu four or five days a week for some reason, then maybe you just only do the technique that your professor drill. has. Maybe you just drill. Yeah. If you, you can drill without getting yourself, you know, mm -hmm. beat up after class and then you can have a great training session the next day. Yep. You just can't do six live rolls and expect totally. to get the most out of it, you know, and totally. Your gym training. Yeah. And there's other ways to hack that process where I can't believe I said hack. I take that back. Alter. <laughs> um, where, you know, so for example, uh, you can deny rules with killers because there's killers at your school and they're like, you want to roll? You're like, ah, I'm good. You know, some days you take them up on it. Some days you don't when you're trying to conserve your shit or, and this is even better move because it's egotistically less obvious, but it works is set yourself a goal. That's minimum energy expenditure and don't let yourself get crazy. So for example, you roll against a killer. You're like, my goal is to start on deep half and either sweep or get to closed guard. And after that, I'm going to restart a deep half. I'm not trying to uh, pass. I'm not trying to submit. If I get pancaked and he's on top of side control, I let him get a sub. I restart. Like, what do you really want to do? When he passes side control and he's squashing you, you're like, fuck this. I'm benching this dumb motherfucker off me. It's on. Oh, you went to Pan Am's. Fuck you. You know, like, uh, you know, cause you know, like it's, there's a temptation there to just fucking rock it out. If you can resist that and keep the roles limited, technical to what it is you want, you end up exerting a 10th of the energy. You get a great session because you're really just training like a very specific thing. You're getting much better at it with a really good guy. It's just not a psycho ego role. If you want to have pure psycho ego roles with everyone, first of all, your time in jiu-jitsu will be much shorter as a healthy practitioner than it otherwise would be. And second of all, say goodbye to balancing anything with bodybuilding or powerlifting or any of that shit. That, that's all we got from Instagram. <laughs> all right. Yeah, Dr. Mike, thank you so much for your time, man. It's always always awesome to have you on the show and uh, appreciate what you're pumping out on that YouTube channel. Can you plug that for us? Dude, thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. Uh, Renaissance Periodization on YouTube. If you can't spell it, fucking that sucks because neither can I. Uh, <laughs> but just Google RP Strength YouTube. Uh, we're just putting out like four or five high-level content videos every week. I've got so many videos in store, so many pre-recorded. We're going to be doing this shit for years. Tons of content, tons of series on fatigue, training, diet, everything. We're pushing YouTube big, and it's it's great. Come join the party. My shitty jokes, Dan Pan humor, awful attempts at shaving and haircuts, and uh, all that stuff is there. And um, yeah, awesome, man. I've been loving the content. Really appreciate your time today. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, Doc. Have a good rest of your day.
Yo, that was good. It's always enter- it's always fun, man. Yeah, always fun. Yeah, somebody was hoping that he had a little bit more secretary jokes. The cock, but the cock he, joke. he the anaconda, just all of the above. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he came with jokes. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was one more question, but I just didn't want to, you know, take his time up with it. It was mm-hmm. in regards to uh, developing bigger traps, but the guy can't do shoulder or he can't do shrugs for some weird reason. Oh. So would it just be like a compound movement or something? Yeah. I mean, Mark, like, honestly, like over the years, I don't think I focus on, uh, you know, shrugs to get traps. It was just mm-hmm. a lot of getting strong with squatting, getting strong with the deadlifting. Oddly enough, because those movements, you have to, Burns. you know, you have to get very strong there. Mark, I mean, I, I know you know a yeah. lot about that. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, just powerlifting in general, just, you know, handling, handling more weight will get used to that. And then, you know, statically your traps are involved in a lot of movements. Um, bench pressing being one of them. I think heavy bench pressing is what helped build up my traps a lot. Um, along with, uh, the heavy squats, obviously having that weight on your back and then deadlifts as well. Um, any back movement that you do a row, um, so you don't really need to do shrugs necessarily. Um, there, there are, there are variations of shrugs that you could probably do that might hurt less. If, if pain is kind of an issue for you, you might want to try them on an incline bench, either facing, uh, the normal way that you would use, utilize an incline bench, or you can face the other way and you can try shrugs. Uh, either one of those ways would, would work well and might be something you might be able to mix into your routine. But, um, I personally never had to, uh, focus on them directly, but every, every person is so different that, uh, maybe that wouldn't be the case for you. You can also try some one arm, uh, shrugs with like a cable or one arm, uh, just holding a dumbbell and you'll find that you get a way better stretch, uh, in the trap using one dumbbell as opposed to two. And then you also have things like farmers carries, um, yoke walks, all those things will get your traps massive. Yeah, I was. I'm. I'm so happy you mentioned that. I was literally like, I was like, please mention farmers walks. Please mention mm-hmm. farmers walks. Like, just grab the heaviest dumbbells you can manage, yeah. hold them at your side, stay tight, and walk thirty paces, thirty paces back. Oof, your traps are gonna burn, and you don't need a shrug. So they're awesome too. Yeah, I really, you know, I, I think, uh, like, you know, as uh, Ensima pointed out, you know, it's not not anything needs to be, you know, trained, you know, really direct. I think. I think it's better use of your time to get them indirectly with movements like that, you know, uh, bench squat, deadlift, bent over rows, seated rows, all those kinds of movements. Probably not a lot of great reasons to waste your time doing a bunch of shrugs anyway. So it's fine that you can't <laughs> find that you can't do them. Awesome. Having uh, Mike on the show again, um, fantastic information uh, talking about, intra workout carbohydrates, pre-workout stuff, post-workout stuff, um, tackled a lot of that stuff on range of motion. I really just wanted to get that dialogue. Like that's the whole reason why we had him on. I just, I wanted that same dialogue delivered to our audience. Cause we could tell people to go over to Renaissance periodization YouTube channel. And I don't know if they would have an opportunity to see it with all the great content that he has over there, but he said it all here today. I, I think that's huge. And, and I'm, I'm learning from him and I I'm getting inspired and excited. Uh, cause I, I just, I, lo- I love this shit. I love training and I love learning and, uh, his style of training is much different than uh, stuff that I've messed around with before. And to be totally honest, when it comes to bodybuilding, I literally don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm very, very new to it. I'm very green and I'm trying to learn and absorb and just have a white belt mentality and just uh, keep absorbing information that I feel is useful and have the wisdom to uh, put it to work. So uh, amazing uh, information from Dr. Mike. Yeah. His YouTube channel is gold. It really is. And he's funny on Instagram too. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He talked about, somebody asked him a question about being a vegan and he talked about how if you're, he's like, if you're vegan and he's like, you're trying to get in the, the amount of protein that you need to be jacked. He's like, how is it possible that you don't turn into a human volcano and just sit on the toilet all fucking day, just blasting shit out your ass all day. <laughs> and I was like, that is the, that is the million dollar question. Cause how do you eat mainly vegetables and just not have your stomach 
in knots all day long. You know, I think like with that, I was, I was talking to a group of people uh, or with a group of people, like there was a lot of individuals in the group that were vegan and plant-based. And I was literally the only person who was meat-based. Everyone was talking about health. And I, I was like, uh, I was just like, let's in the back of my head. I'm like, okay, I think everyone's just going to need a little bit of time to try it so that they can experience it for a few months. And then they'll come back to eating some meat. Um, I think that's just what's going to happen. That's what ends up really happening with a lot of them. I'm surprised they don't look at you and, and just be like, okay, well, and seem is the healthiest. So maybe we should, maybe we should fucking talk to him just to get some insight. You know, it's because there are also some jacked vegans in there. They're like, there, there are some like decently looking vegans. Right. They didn't look insane, but they were like, they looked fit. Right. But how long were they vegan for though? Uh, have, have they been? I, should say. I think uh, the the main guy he's been vegan for like a year and a half. Oh, okay, right? so that's it, it's that's been a, it's a long, been a decent amount of time. time. Yeah, but but it was just like you know, I, I the way I was I was like you know what, no one in here is doing anything wrong. But if you just want to add a little bit of meat or try this, give it a shot. Yeah, it's it's also okay. really uh, really great when you like when somebody <laughs> says they want to cut meat out because it's so bad, and, uh, and then you but you inform them like no, actually, yeah. if you do this, and then you know keep your calories in check. Like it's actually really healthy. Yeah. Like, what? Like they, you know, it's like a celebration for them. Like, no, I've been told that it's bad my whole life. Like, yeah. No, you're good. <laughs> well, I think there's a couple things going on when people turn vegan. So number one is there's, and there's a lot of research that shows us that just a change in diet period has a massive effect on you. Uh, an example of that is, uh, you know, me recommending some carbs to Ron Penna who hasn't eaten carbs in a really long time. And he started utilizing some, uh, about 200 grams of carbohydrates post-workout. And he's just, he went through the roof. He loved it. He gained muscle. He felt really good, but that lasted for about three weeks. And then the results kind of died off. And now he's back to lowering his, uh, carbohydrates again, because the, the impact is seen simply just from the change. So just any change in your nutrition, uh, will most likely, you know, if, if it's a change, uh, where the goal is to either gain muscle or lose fat and it is at least halfway headed in that direction, you would probably get some of that result. Um, the other thing is I think when people say that they're going to cut out meat, I think they're cutting out maybe some, uh, they're cutting out bad habits and that's, they're not mentioning that they're not mentioning like, but what do you mean by like, you know, if you ask them, you went a couple questions deep on them and said, what do you mean by cutting out meat? What specifically, like, where is meat in your diet? Like, where do you, where do you get your meat from? Where, you know, currently or in the past, where have you gotten your meat from? They're like, oh, I roll through McDonald's, you know, usually every day, you know, coming from work or I go to Chipotle. And so it's not really just meat. They're eating meat a bu with a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and they're making a lot of bad food choices in general, and they have a, they have just in general have bad habits. So, if you switch from one diet to another, you're already seeing improvement. But if you switch from really not having a diet at all, like you just don't have any discipline at all in your nutrition, and now you're like, I'm going to get rid of meat, but you got rid of meat, and you also got rid of a bunch of bad habits in favor of some other foods. I think that's perfectly fine. And I actually think that will be healthier. And I think that is a great thing to explore and a great thing to try. I think where people get caught up and where they get mixed up is whenever somebody jumps into keto or whenever somebody jumps into uh, veganism or any of these things, they eat the Franken foods. They eat these weird foods that are, you know, um, designed by some of our friends. We know some people that make delicious foods that are, this way that give you a snack and those things are supposed to be eaten occasionally. Um, but these weird foods that they make for vegans, vegan brownies and stuff, that's not the, not the reason to be vegan. The reason to be uh, gluten-free isn't to have a gluten-free donut or gluten-free cake or gluten-free pasta. The reason to be gluten-free is to not eat any fucking pasta <laughs> and not have gluten-free bread. You just don't eat fucking bread anymore. Like those are, now, if you want it on occasion and there's reasons for you to be gluten free or you, there's reasons for you to abstain from meat, uh, then yes, you have uh, one of those weird uh, vegetable burgers that taste like meat. Um, that, that makes sense. But I, I don't really think that, you know, somebody turning vegan or any of those things, I don't, I don't necessarily think they're bad. I think it's a, I think it's good. And I think it's a positive step you know, in somebody's journey and maybe they'll learn more about themselves. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, it, it's not, it's not wrong. It's not bad. It's healthier mm -hmm. than the standard American diet. Yeah. You know, Mark, real quick, I don't <laughs> know, but I'm curious um, to know if this is happening to you. I think Jessica told me that you said it might be happening to you too. I've found that because it's winter or like, as it got colder, um, I don't, like, I don't necessarily want to fast as much. I feel the need mm -hmm. and the want to just eat a little bit more often. Um, and it's like, I, I naturally, like every winter this happens. I'm like, what the, wait, yeah, it happens. It's happening again. How are you feeling? Do you feel this or you just not really? No, I think there's something to it. I think there's definitely something to like circadian rhythm. You know, um, if you think about it, it makes sense. You know, lights are out earlier. You know, you have less sunlight and it's getting colder. And if we were, you know, around thousands of years ago, we would have to be storing up, you know, we'd have to be building up our calories now. Cause we're like, Hey, like it's kind of cold out and it's kind of dark, but it's about to be really fucking cold out and really fucking dark. Mm -hmm. And so it would make sense that you would start to eat more. We probably would have started eating more even a little bit earlier, maybe even a few weeks ago uh, when you still had like, um, you know, berries around and shit like that. But, yeah, I, I, I find that myself and I find that certain times of year is bring, brings along certain kinds of cravings and it's probably more environmental than anything. Like, uh, this time of year, you know, you start thinking about Thanksgiving and you start thinking about Christmas. And so everything is based around like family and food. Um, and then in the summertime for me, like I'm always thinking of like, uh, I always want to drink like fucking orange juice and shit like that, or, or have like fruit or, fruit juice. Um, and I never do, but I just, for whatever reason, I kind of, I crave just sweeter drinks and, and things of that nature, uh, when it's hotter out. And then when it's, when it's colder out, I crave, you know, you know, just good home cooked meals and, and staying inside with family and just eating the, sh eating the crap out of food all day. <laughs> yeah. Shoot. All right, man. You want to take us on out of here, Andrew? I will. Yep. Uh, thank you everybody for checking out today's episode. Huge shout out. And thank you to free sleep for sponsoring today's episode. Uh, links down in the description below uh, code power 25 gets you 25% off your order and uh, free domestic shipping. Uh, please make sure you're following the podcast at Mark Bell's power project on Instagram uh, at MB power project on Twitter, which they just announced they have uh, like Twitter stories now. So more places to catch the podcast. It's weird. All social medias are all turning into the exact same platform now. They're also like, getting rooms like, you know, rooms. Yeah. They're going to get, yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. Well, right. I'll figure that one out later. Uh, my Instagram is at I am Andrew Z and Seema, where are you at? And Seema and Yang on Instagram and YouTube and Seema and Yang on Twitter. Mark. I'm at Mark's Billy Bell. Strength is never weakness. Weakness, never strength. Catch y'all later.